Uh, and then I just want to talk about our guest tonight, Patrick. Um, I'm really stoked that he's up here because um, I'm about halfway through his new book that he just wrote on customer development. So for those of you that don't know too much about uh, what Lean Startup means, at least in the context of this group, um, one of the definitions is, uh, you know, when you're using agile methodology with customer development. So this is one half of the equation, and Patrick's written a book on it, uh, co-authored a book on it that's uh, pretty fantastic. So I'm really excited to have him here. He's an entrepreneur. He, um, uh, you know, came into the tech scene, uh, re-entered the tech scene and read Four Steps to the Epiphany, which is Steve Blank's book. He's one of the, sort of the fathers the, of the thought, you know, of the, of the uh, uh, what would you call him? One of the forefathers of this. Uh, yeah. And that book was written about four years ago. Um, for me, I found that kind of a tough read, um, pretty dense, and I tell people it's not enough pictures to hold my attention. Um, and Patrick's book kind of updates the thinking on it, uh, you know, because it is four years old and makes it a little more accessible. So um, I'm really happy that, that he wrote that because I'm already using it, like now. I've been anxiously waiting my copy, printed it out, and I'm using it. Uh, at savings. So without further ado, here's Patrick. So uh, one more time, I guess, uh, who has heard the term lean startups? Just want to kind of get engaged. The, okay. And then the term customer development. Okay, so uh, as, uh, as Pete and Joe mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about customer development. Uh, and more about the actual the, the customer and the marketing side, or the market side of the Lean Startup methodologies versus the engineering side. Um, and I co-authored a book with a guy named Greg Cooper. Um, and uh, anyway, without further ado, we'll just jump right into this. So the, the, the progenitor or the godfather of this is a guy named Steve Blank. Um, he wrote a great book called The Four Steps of Epiphany. I highly recommend that anyone in uh, startups read that book. Um, and he had a couple of epiphanies or insights that are, that are universal to, to startups. And the, the first of which is that startups don't fail because they don't deliver a product. Generally, startups do deliver a product to market. Okay? They fail because they don't have customers. They fail because they try to force a product onto a market that doesn't exist. Right? That that's, happens to be a sort of universal truth, I think. And the classic case of that is Webvan, you may remember from 2000. right? They spend like $800 million into uh, deli you know, delivering home delivery groceries, and it was all for naught. Um, second, um, the startup school is to find a repeatable and scalable business model. That's its reasons for existence. Okay? And the way you go about that is doing something called that, that Steve calls customer development, is where you actually go out and find that model. Okay? And this is very different from build it and they will come sort of thinking, which has probably been you know, pretty, pretty prevalent in the startup space for a lot of people where, okay, I have this great idea, I'm going to sell some VCs on it, I'm going to spend nine months in a cave, I'm going to code it, and then I'm going to blow up and have a $900 million exit. Okay? Yes, that happens once in a while, but it's really not repeatable. Um, so customer development is, is what Steve Blank did, actually codified a lot of the things that people already did. They may have not called it customer development, but they already did very similar things, such as what he calls getting out of the building, where the founder actually goes out and tries to measure the pain and the problem they're actually solving. So, and uh, this is actually a figure from, the, from our book, and this is, this is again Steve's four steps of customer development. And the first is what he calls customer discovery, where you find, you actually test whether or not your solution is actually matches what you think is the customer's pain. Uh, you build what's called MVP, a minimal viable product, and you uh, try to ascertain how you can actually uh, build a funnel that actually captures a customer. Um, it goes on product market fit. All these things actually, you've probably heard a lot of these terms. They're the you know the Twitter, Twitter sphere, such a word. There's all the buzz about things like that. I want to actually step away from the the actual buzzwords and jargon for a second, and actually want to talk about two case studies that aren't in the book which I think you guys have found pretty, pretty relevant, pretty interesting. Um, also, it's funny, uh, just recently, uh, some of you guys may know this, uh, there's been sort of a, kind of a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say backlash, but some people have called customer development NorCal Kool-Aid. Uh, so I think some folks in the, in the LA area, I think it's kind of funny. Uh, I'd like you to judge, you know, what, as we go through this presentation, whether or not, whether or not it's Kool-Aid or not. And I guess if it is, I, I'm drinking it. So. 
So the first case study is, uh, is a friend of mine. He's got a, uh, a startup called ProProfs, and they do online quizzes, right? So you can share them on Twitter, you can create a quiz, you can share with your friends on Facebook. Uh, you can see they have sort of two verticals here, uh, the education and the, uh, the corporate verticals, that's sort of like training. And uh, he actually, at the time of this, he had 300,000 registered users. So he's got a good amount of users. It's a lot of user data. He does quite well. He sees a lot of traffic on the site and, uh, and makes some money as well. Um, the, the way he described it is, you know, paper is the enemy, right? It makes perfect sense, right? Online quiz replaces paper. Right? I don't think there's anything terribly surprising about that. So they rolled out a new design. And lo and behold, the users started complaining. And, and first, it kind of ignored. He had some freemium. He's got a freemium model, so some of the free customers started complaining. Kind of ignored them, and some of his paying customers actually uh, complained as well. So it was okay. Well, if someone's paying, I should really you know figure out what the problem is. Turns out the print the quiz feature hadn't made it across with the new with the new design with the new UI, right? Which is kind of odd because the whole value proposition of his entire business, at least for the at least for the, the paying customers, is you get to do all my quizzes, right? right? It makes, so it's, it's kind of odd. So, so he gets on the phone and he talks to two of his customers. One is a trucking company, and one is a, uh, a hospital administrator where they do training for nurses. And they use these quizzes for training, keeping their employees up to date, right? Um, he has an extended conversation. This is sort of what, this is what Steve Blank calls getting out of the building, where the founder is on the phone talking to their customers or potential customers and trying to figure out what the pain is and what the solution is, right? So this is not like, oh, I'll just send a sales guy or a customer service rep or what have you. The founder is actually on the phone having a conversation. Um, he has what I like to call a Kaiser Soze moment. I don't know if you guys remember what Kaiser Soze is. Some of the younger folks might not. Holy bomb. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> usual suspects. Usual suspects. If you guys remember the usual suspects, and at the very end, everything changes, right? And that's exactly what happened to, to our friend here. Turns out, after he had spoken to his, uh, his paying customers, turns out uh, they don't use any of the sharing features. They don't actually do any of the online stuff that he actually thought was a unique value proposition. Turns out they use the, his, they use ProProfs uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a replacement for Word, Microsoft Word. And what they like is reordering the questions on the fly, randomizing the questions, and then printing them out. If remember, before he actually went, and this is actually after he's got 300,000 users, remember, paper is the enemy. That's when he actually, it was a pretty good assumption. He's got 300,000 people telling him, or at least he thinks he's telling that paper is the enemy. Turns out it's actually not the enemy. Right? Uh, again, this, this sort of insight only comes from what Steve Blank likes to say is getting out of the building and actually talking to your customers, which sounds very obvious and sounds very matter of fact, but if it were so obvious, you wouldn't see vast sums of money being wasted in terms, again, like uh, Webvan or any of the dot-com bombs we had in you know the 2000s, right? Um, you know, I don't know how many companies were selling dog food online, right? Did anyone actually check to see if that was solving any sort of pain? I don't think so. So, what happened? Uh, the value proposition for paying customers was re revealed because he actually got on the phone and, and talked to these folks. It changed essentially uh, everything in his company, his features, his position, um, and uh, how he priced his product and his marketing copy. Changed the funnel, changed uh, what segments he's going after and how he's going after them. Um, another case study, this is a little bit... What classic. happened? What's that? What happened? This, happened, this just happened recently. So oh, he doesn't know what happened. No, he's, he just recently enacted, enacted these changes, uh, but he's happened. getting closer to, he's finding, he's getting closer to, to, number one, he's found why people are paying for him, right? Yeah. Until hitherto, he had thought, oh, okay, it's because I'm replacing paper. Turns out that none yeah. of the, they use any of these features, right? So now he can actually take that knowledge and then scale and, 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 and assume, right. right, exactly. So it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime. In a sense that you don't know that you're right until you've implemented them and, and see what happens, right? So absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So and that's, that's the, the kind of core of what this yeah. stuff is about. Yes, and, and if this actually doesn't work, then yeah. what happens? He goes, he goes back, back outside. outside. Yes, exactly. 
So then that they try another thing. You iterate. Right. So you iterate, exactly. Yeah. That's a core, that's a core uh, component of, of both the engineering side, the lean startup side, as far, but as far as actually the customer development side, is iterate. Yeah. He's finding product market fit is what he's doing. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Precisely. Here's one, so here's a little, this is one that hits a little closer to home. This is a uh, startup, and this is what really uh, made me, I guess, drink the Kool-Aid. Is I, I had a startup and that I that I actually started after I read Four Steps of the Epiphany. And I wanted to go. Okay, I'm going to try this out. You know, this this stuff seems to make sense. Uh, previous to that, I had spent a lot of money and a lot of time and built something and never got used. A complete disaster. I'm like, okay, well, why don't we why don't we try this, right? Why don't I you know, question my assumptions? So the uh, startup I had it was about uh, event-based social networking. Essentially, event attendees can come uh, and network with one another before an event, right? Before, during, and after. Right, uh, and the way we surmise it, that for nonprofit events, it would probably be pretty valuable. Right? I don't know if you guys have been to a lot of nonprofit events, but the, you know, generally the business leaders in the local community are very active in networking there. So we thought, okay, well, technologically, that's really not that difficult. Why don't we enhance our networking? Ergo, make the event more valuable. Ergo, event organizers can sell more tickets at higher prices. That was we thought was a pretty reasonable assertion. Um, here are the sort of the pains we, we, as we as we saw them, um, covered that, and uh, you know what we thought would be the benefits and, and the solution. Right? And the way we went about doing this is again we wanted to test: is there a problem? If so, is our is our answer is our application the solution? Can we get paid for this? And uh, who are the people that actually would pay us for this? Right? And we want to do this actually before coding anything. We want it before we actually. With a line of code, let's go and, and test this idea and see if it actually, we want to make money, right? So we don't want to just beg for people to use it. And so what we did, we did uh, two things. So we built some screenshots. So this is actually a Photoshop. It's not actually, it's not a web app sitting anywhere. This is actually a Photoshop still um, that we put in like a browser template. And actually looking at it, it's funny because it's really hideously, it's, it's hideous. And I look at it, it's like, ah, yet. The, the people we were showing it to actually really liked it and gave us instantaneous feedback. So number one, we got we put in front of someone, hey, look, this is what we're you know, building. This would be sort of a, you know the, the event landing page. Immediately got feedback. So number one, and I should also mention the cost for this was you know 100, 200 bucks. I forget what our graphic designer mentioned. Here was a very simple event attendee list. Again, hideous, uh, <laughs> hideous, uh, but actually very good for for getting feedback without actually spending a lot of time and money. Um, here is where if you wanted to message someone. Another thing we did, and this is what we did, is we actually, when we got people that were interested, we actually gave them a letter of intent. We said, okay, look, we want you to sign this letter of intent that says you'll use the product, and if you like it, you actually pay for it. And this is how much you pay for it. So the idea there was we wanted to figure out if anyone will pay for it, what they would pay for it, Right? Do they actually want to use it? A lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll throw an idea, especially to your friends or your colleagues, hey, I have a great idea for this amazing web app. What do you think? Sounds awesome. I totally use it. <laughs> right? I, I don't know if you guys have ever had that happen to you. <laughs> it, you know, that's kind of a social lubrication. Right? No one's ever going to say, your idea sucks. I don't want to hear about it. Right? So uh, we, we wanted to actually uh, learn about our idea and test our idea before we actually spend a lot of time and money doing it. So were, were there, was there any teeth in your LOI? Uh, no. So, great, great question. So, it was not a, it was not any sort of a legally binding uh, contract. Um, it was, uh, there was no, we had some people balk, uh, but there was no, we didn't do it in such a, in a manner where there would have been any sort of legal recourse. Great question. Are, are you doing different price points on that? So, it's like, once 500 a month or once 5,000? Right. Uh, exactly. We actually did that. So, what we, we literally, we, uh, we had, I remember we had a couple appointments. We threw it in front of some people, like, oh, it's 199 a month. And the person said, ah, oh, no problem. Okay. Sign it. That means we're underpriced, right? Literally half hour later, we're like, oh, it's three ninety a month. No problem. I'm not this to happen, right? And then we're like, okay, now we're getting we can we'll, we want to get people to actually to balk, right, and start negotiating because not only does that sort of set the hook, but it gives us meaningful data where what we can actually get for this and, and what kind of pains we're solving, right? Um, any more questions? Feel free to anyway jump in anyone. Same question I have. Yeah. So so just to be clear, so this was like something like. Try a product out, and after 60 days or 30 days, um, you, you agree to pay for a product at this price. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's kind of small, so it says, um, they, um, 
we agreed to do it for them for free uh, for the first time. Uh, it's pre and post event attending social networking. We create a simple profile, basic reporting functionality, and we said they agree to fairly evaluate, provide feedback. After the four week free evaluation period, um, if they're satisfied, they agree to use it at a, we give them a discounted fee. Um, and then if the, 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 what I thought was sort of the money, uh, the hook was at the bottom it says, it is the intent of client to enter into formal agreement, right? We, and, and that's sort of a strong thing to say. Again, uh, it doesn't really have teeth. We're not gonna litigate, we're not gonna, you know, fight this. But that doesn't mean something. Some people did balk. Another thing this also does, it actually separates the wheat from the chaff in a lot of ways. Where people, you find your early adopters, which is very important, in where people are like, okay, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, we had literally people like salivating, like, awesome, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And we had some people like, no, 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 no. A legal team will never do this, right? And you see different people's risk uh, preferences and appetites, and who would make a good early adopter and who wouldn't, right? So, you know, good early adopters, we had one client, disastrous launch, tons of bugs, and I get on the phone with them, expecting them just to, you know, just to kill me all over the phone. And they're like, look, I found the bug. They actually went out, like, searched for the bugs, wrote them down, sent them over. They're like, can you fix those? And so we you know, work all night. We fixed it, and they were super happy, right? That's an early adopter. It really drives you. It you know, makes you feel better about what you're doing. They give instantaneous feedback. They want to see you succeed, right? A lot of people don't understand. The early adopters, they like being the heroes within their organization. Like, look, I brought these guys in. They're doing kicking ass, they're using their product, they want to be the hero, they want you guys to be heroes. Right? They're different, radically different than the mainstream, right? So, and could, um, the profile of the people, the people that you were talking to, yeah. right, were they people in like different sizes of companies? So were you talking to people in small companies, which is different from somebody who's a manager at a bigger company? And, and you know, could you just talk a little bit sure. about the kind of people that you're talking to? Great question. So when we first, our first, segment that we attacked was, was non-profits. Right. And that was our, where we wanted to go after a specific uh, uh, segment. We didn't want to just go after trade shows in general. So, okay, we want to do non-profit events. We want to be very, very hyper-focused. So we started talking about you know, event managers, uh, non-profit directors. And what happens actually, you see a very uh, uh, bimodal distribution where we saw people who were really into this. Like, oh, this is awesome. We need this. We need this. And then you had these other people like, what is this? No, I don't, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? So we had definitely had different feedback as far as. Well, what kind of level of the organization are these people that you're talking to? Uh, you know, they're generally the event managers, so, you know, a few rungs down from the top. But generally, it's a small organization. Uh, if you're talking about a local or regional nonprofit, so they're not, you know, they're in the office. But they thing. themselves have the budgetary authority to. Great, great, great point. Exactly. So that was another thing, you know, when we'd have these conversations with them is we'd, we'd figure out what was their budget, right? Do they have the budgetary authority, right? Some cases they did, some cases they, they didn't. Um, and another thing we actually found out, since this is actually event-based, was very interesting to me. I, I'm a pride myself in being pretty rational, pretty logical. And so we were figuring out how would we price this? And this, in this case, we priced it on a monthly basis. So I said, well, why don't we do it on an event basis? And we talked to our customers. They said, well, look, it's actually better if you month price it on a monthly basis even though it might cost us more, it's easier for me to budget X amount over 12 months than it is for me to see spikes in the budget, right? And they said this fully aware of the fact that they would be paying more on a monthly basis. Like, that's fine. That's something I wouldn't have come to, known about or thought about had I not actually had these customer development conversations. Uh, and that, that fed directly into our, you know, our, our model. One more question? Please, please. Um, what did you, at the time you were asking these people this question, right, which is great by the way, um, what sales process were you envisaging? Because if you figure out that the, you know, let's say you're charging someone 500 bucks a month, which is 6,000 bucks a year, and you're doing what is effectively, it's a combination of marketing, market research, but also in a sense it's an implied direct sale if that's how you envision yeah. doing it. You can't have a sales force for six thousand dollars. You're here. you're right on the money actually. And I, and I, let me let me put that question on the back burner okay. and I'm, I'm gonna address that. You're actually right on the money. Okay. Um, so back here. So this is what we you know we were discovering learning etc. And then we agreed to, until we had two side LOIs we wouldn't write in code. We did. So again, you know, we were building something that people would use and then they intended to pay for it. The sales cycle as this gentleman here is has is just a little is underway, we found some early adopters. And then we also learned a ton about web about positioning, where you know I come in a meeting like, oh, we do this great web app, and they're like, what's a web app? I'm like, oh, okay. And then you have to actually reframe in terms of 
how your customer sees the market, right? If I say, you know, um, it's Facebook for, for nonprofits, that might help a little bit, right? They go, okay, I know what Facebook is, I'm, I'm, I work in nonprofit, et cetera, et cetera, right? But this really, this is quite informative, learning about just not even about features or the problem, but how, where they find the solutions that they, that they need and how, what they call them, right? The term web app to this audience means absolutely nothing. I didn't know that until actually meeting these people and talking to them, right? And that affected how we positioned the company, the, the marketing, what kind of ads we created, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Two, two signed LOIs seems like an awfully small number here. Yes. Because you, you, could, you could encounter a couple friends, basically, and so I'm curious about them. Great question. Great question. So, uh, uh, number one is you'll never get, I don't think, a statistically significant amount, right? And this is something that Azra and I were talking about. Um, but the, we measured in terms of potential revenue, and I don't know if that's a good way to back into it too, but you're right. We, but we did in, implicitly, except, I should say explicitly, avoid approaching friends. And that's whenever I talk to someone about, about startups and customer development, people go, oh, I'm going to get my friends to try it. And I say, no, no, go get perfect strangers who don't know you, who, don't, who have a professional relationship with you, right? But you're right, you know, we could have, we could have actually done, um, could have done more. That we, and we actually did end up getting more, but we started coding after we had two. That was kind of our, you know, we were kind of foaming at the mouth sort of thing. Is there sort of a rule of thumb around it or anything like that? that I don't know. I, don't, I was just making this stuff up, so I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know. If, I mean, you know. You know, I'm imagining it depends on, I imagine on the, you know, the vertical, the industry, and you know, what, kind of, uh, what kind of industry experience you have as, as well. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's a rule of thumb around it. This was just the way I, I, I couch it with people. That this is an arsenal that we this is a weapon in our arsenal we use for customer development and you know go ahead and, and, and use it and okay. did you have a, uh, no I, I got a call like there's a guy up the street uh, service master SOA software he does a similar model but he does a one LOI but it's an LOI with some teeth for a million bucks right that's a good way to do it too right depends if you're selling you know hundred thousand dollar implementation that might be a good way to do it yeah. right but can but that I don't understand how that could work right? because if you if you have if you have what is effectively a contract, right, with a price, you're buying something that then you have to specify what the thing is, right? Otherwise, you're, you don't have any teeth. So that presumes that you've already specified the thing before you talk to it, which is kind of well. So one thing I don't get how that could possibly well, one work. thing the way ours worked, by the way, is we didn't we kind of let ourselves off the hook, right? So if it would have been a little bit embarrassing and awkward, but we. Could have said, look, we decided to close up shop. We're not building anything because no one's going to sign the LOI, right? If we only get one LOI and had a string of failures, we could have potentially called up that one person and said, look, sorry, it's not happening, and they wouldn't have been in for it. You know, they have a little skin in the game in terms of social uh, capital, but they certainly don't have, you know, any other. They don't have any money in it, right? So, but again, uh, an LOI with teeth might be applicable to another project. So it's completely non-agile, though, isn't it? I don't know. You know, it depends on the project. I, I'm actually. I'm really into this stuff, and like I said, I drink the Kool-Aid, uh, but I'm very non-dogmatic, and, and it depends on the project, you know. I, I've heard of projects being being undertaken with similar type of things where people have sold the project and completely bluffed their way through and, and done exactly things like that and have a great success. So, anyway. So, again, uh, I keep doing this customer development, and then, actually, I have my Kaiser Soze moment, actually. And this goes to what actually the gentleman here who's not a client of mine, actually, is, is, is I was talking to a guy at a business journal, and the business journal folks, they're an interesting spot because like all print media, their subscription, you know, their, their base is, is, is hurting, they're, they're selling uh, less, uh, less subscription. And he flat out told me, he goes, look, you're missing the point here, dude. He goes, it's about the sponsors. We don't care about the entities. And this guy throws a lot of, he throws, you know, two or three events a month, each more than a thousand people. He goes, look, we don't care about the attendees, it's about the sponsors, okay? That's why, and he didn't use the word, the, the word sort of the term product market fit, but that's why we were kind of limping along. He goes, this is why you don't have, you know, if you can figure out a, well, I'll get to you in one second. If you figure out a product that, yeah, it takes care of the attendees, but really offers value to the sponsors, that then the organizers that can resell, because then you'll hit it out of the park. What do you mean, like tracking the sponsor's ROI? And that, that's another great question. What that means is I don't know. And, actually, and so nobody knows what that is. And that's actually like this, kind of the, the, the next set of iterations. 
and, and there's actually multiple, so like, I don't know if you see, the Zarista crowd got event view pathable. There's those and a few others are in this sort of event, social networking space, um, PlanCast, which some of you guys might be familiar with. They're actually taking a different sort of view where the attendees are providing the event information. Much more organic, very cool stuff. Um, what that actually means, like you, as far as for, it's not, no one's going to give you the holy grail and be like, look, you got to build this and you make millions, right? Sometimes people will give you their opinions, they'll say things like that, but the, no one actually knows, right? Now, so what happened with, with me, for reasons that have nothing to do with customer development or lean startup, my co founder and I went our separate ways. And so we were actually, this is kind of where we left it, where we, like, we had this epiphany, right? Okay, we, here's what we want to pivot. Right? The market is telling us something. So it's not, we're not pivoting just for the sake of pivoting. We all want to pivot into here. Uh, and then back to your, your question about the sales model, that was driving me crazy as well, because like you said, you know, if we're selling a subscription model you know, for $6,000 a year, you need, the, the, the direct sales model just doesn't work. Right, so actually, so this whole idea actually got, got sort of tabled and is on the back burner. Which is actually not a bad outcome if you think about it. In terms of, in terms of customer development, it's not necessarily about creating YouTubes or Facebooks or Twitters, but it's about avoiding the web vans and the, the creators. Does that make sense? So, so, so lowering the problem. And if you get feedback, one second, old, if you if you get good feedback that tells you this is not a good idea, this is not a good idea, this is not a good idea, then you go, wait, this might not be a good idea. Right? <laughs> and then you can save time, money, blood, sweat, and tears. You can either pivot to something else. Or scrap it, and, and you're seeing people doing that. And I think it's actually very valuable. You know, we only have so much time on Earth here. And go ahead. In, in addition to being an author and entrepreneur, could you give us a little bit of your background so we can kind of see what point of view you're coming from? Sure, sure, sure. So uh, I actually uh, I have a bachelor's in anthropology and a master's in economics, both from UCSB. Um, and after college, the, uh, my roommate and I started a tech company, uh, and then I actually. I left when he spent some time in Europe and did finance um, and, uh, and real estate. Uh, came back to the States, did some finance, real estate, and then kind of was really missing the tech stuff and got back into the tech stuff. So, uh, Lowell, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, you meant, um, your comment about that's a great, um, that's great feedback so that you don't go down that path that would have been unsuccessful. Even on a feature level, like you hear successful startup founder after founder um, talk about their, their, you know, sort of the, what they or, or the most integral part of their success was not what they chose to do, but the, the things they chose not to implement. Um, right, I agree. I totally agree. And, and it's, it's something that Eric Rees uh, talks about all the time, is that features don't necessarily equate progress, right? It's not just because you've pushed another feature, it doesn't actually mean you've actually made your company more profitable or, or done something. And, and it feels like it does or looks like it does. And it's fun to pretend it does, but it doesn't. Right, and I'm probably simplifying. I'm not nearly as eloquent as Eric is, but I think. And, go ahead. And it also, I think, plays into like I know with myself. I've been working on something for several months, and we're uh, getting ready to start private beta. But I, um, you know, it's in, in the, I'm a first first time entrepreneur, uh, and it's interesting, like this idea of talking to a lot of people and um, to get feedback, and you know, sort of how close to the best you want to keep your your concept and and, and your intentions. And um, like you know, there's all this emphasis now. It seems, especially through this new process of like opening the kimono and letting people in and, and talking about your product, um, you know. But then, then okay, you fear you fear people are going to take your concept and then build it, or or, or after you launch, they're going to replicate it. But I think those concerns are overblown because um, ultimately only you develop the insight that leads you to ignore nine out of the ten features that you were focusing on. Yep. So this idea of getting out there and talking to people and, and, and doing customer development just gives you more and more insight, which helps you be you know, more and more innovative. My, my co-author actually has a great quote on this that he, we have in the book that he came up with where he says, Brent, his name is Brent Cooper, he says, the, the founder owns the vision, but the customer owns the pain. And, and that's the, kind of the art of entrepreneurship is you take that you match both, right? You have to have a vision for where you want to be. And it's not just, you know, as Steve Blanks likes to say, it's not like a Accountants don't do startups because you can't just do everything by spreadsheet. You know, there's this intangible quality to figuring out what features you want to do, how you talk to people, what sort of information you elicit from them, right? And that kind of that speaks exactly. What you're Can I just comment on that a second? Because sure. that's a really interesting point. I, mean, I think um, the success of a company, particularly an innovative company, 
right? Which is, you know, if you're in a stealth situation, which you think you've lost the really great, the idea it is to develop a market typically in this one on one company, right? Competitors aren't a bad thing. You know, competitors are a good thing, they keep you honest, and they're going to spend a lot of money on marketing too, and that educates customers, which grows your potential market, because you can grow by, you know, you, you know even if you've only got 10%, if the whole market's growing at 50%, you're getting 10% percent so it's growing at 50%. Yeah. So, you know, competitors aren't a bad thing. But, yeah. You know, so, you know, you're lucky if you attract competitors in a new market. Yeah. I mean, do you want to... sounds crazy, but it's yeah. true. I mean, so do you want to share your vision with the... The guy you know has similar experience and is equipped to execute on your concept. Maybe you want to avoid that guy for a little while. Well, you don't have to but, 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 yeah. but to your point, like you can't be. No, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. You can't be overly concerned about people creeping in. Well, there's a time. It's yeah. all timing. I mean, you can't be kind of paranoid. Well, I don't know what's got great, great ideas. It's executing on it to get some. So yeah. I mean, you got to think as soon as you launch, if you have a great idea, someone's going to put money behind it, hire two guys in their Ukraine to duplicate it. Or a big, a, a big, uh, a bigger company is gonna is gonna come across their radar, and they have the resources to match you. Yeah. So, so keeping an idea quiet, I only serves a period for a period of time because I really, you know, as we saw during the dot com bubble, not there's not much advantage to the first mover advantage. I, I would, you know, I would agree with that as well. I'm, to be, but before I say that, actually, take everything I say with a grain of salt. I don't have any big wins to point to and say I did that. So whatever I say, feel free to throw a lot of salt on it. Um, but Sean Ellis, uh, whose blog everybody in this room should be reading, talks about this, and he says most startups obsess too much about their equally clueless competition. Right. So you're, you're in this new market. You have a new product. You're trying to figure out it out. Right? And you look at your, your competitor, like, oh, he just launched Feature X. We need Feature X, right? Sean House makes a great list. They don't know what they're doing. You don't know what you're doing. You know, your, your, your biggest competition is yourself, not, not the guy next to you. And I think that makes sense for the patterns that I've seen. Um, so, how do you avoid Facebook? Pardon me? Like Facebook, probably, you know, Facebook. What about Facebook? You know, somebody else had the idea and they stole interest in it. Right. I mean, that. I'm not sure the question. I'm not sure. You're right. just saying that even I mean, Facebook was more original. Right. right. And well, even Facebook, but, but you guys forget, like, there was, even before Facebook, That's there was something called Six Degrees. I don't know if you guys remember Six Degrees. Friendster. 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 Before there was Six Degrees, yeah. Six Degrees really never took off. And then I think those guys went and did Photolog. But that was, I mean, so as long as you have ideas that are ahead of their time, right? And then Friendster kind of went up and then went down. And then Facebook happened to find product market fit. Also, I'm of the of the opinion that uh, startups are are in essence looking for black swans. And if you guys have read a book called Black Swan by Talib, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Where if, this is just my opinion, right? So you're going to hear me kind of bullshitting a little bit here. But if we re rewound history, it's not necessarily true, in my opinion, that Facebook would be the giant and MySpace would be the giants of social networking. Right? I don't think it's like preordained or kind of written. And then I think there were very specific things that happened in each in each case right. that led to whoever you know was successful becoming successful. Right, right, right. Like in the case of like, like Facebook versus Friendster, right. like Friendster completely fell down, down the job in terms of scaling, um, right. like the, the back end, the operations. Um, so everyone left in droves. You know, it was you know. right. So. Yeah, I just want to make two comments. One is um, the, the idea of being too open is if your if your idea is so great that it's going to attract Johnson & Johnson, that's a problem. But if, if you're a small startup and you're taking a small niche, uh, it would be good to find a niche that's too small for Johnson & Johnson to drive more. Right. And then as you build your company, you can do larger and larger niches. Right. Secondly, there are some intellectual property protections that you can get that is not too expensive and you don't want to become too attached to it anyway because you may lose it in the next iteration. Correct. But you can take steps to prevent any intellectual property that you think you may have <coughs> until you want to abandon it. On the tactical level, I, you know, I would say talk, be open with your customers, figure out, you know, have these customer development conversations, but I wouldn't go to my potential competitors and, you know, hey, I'm doing this, and this is what I learned from my, you know, you know, conversations with my potential customers, right? So, I mean, that's probably common sense, right? So anyway, here's the plug for the book. 
Uh, you can get it at custdev.com and Lean LA, I think it's 20% off promo code. Uh, Steve Blank was kind enough to write the uh, forward to the book. And uh, as you can see, we called it a cheat sheet to the four steps. <laughs> oh, blogs you guys should be reading if you aren't. Uh, Steve's, Eric's, Sean's, uh, Dave McClure, Venture Hacks, uh, Brant's blog is the co-author. Uh, and then if you're not on the Lean Startup Circle, on the Google groups, you should be. It's all, these are all excellent resources. Um, so you can get a hold of me if you like. That's it. Yeah. You come to the or this people pointing at this and um, saying that it's Kool-Aid. Like what what counter argument exists? Like people and I were just were talking about this earlier. Like what if like people who don't believe in, in lean processes, like what what's the what's the argument? Well there's a few different arguments. Some some I think are more valid than others. Uh, one is that people say, Oh, this is just market research. Uh, it's really not market research. You know, market research is a market research analyst view. You, can, you know, often when when you know uh, people create the, uh, pitches for VCs, they can get, okay, Gartner Group says this, this, this. This is actually the founder going out and, and finding firsthand, right? So this is radically different than market research done by third party. Plus, the, the way you want to—it's also presenting this very specific idea or hypothesis or product to someone right. and getting their reactions, as opposed to the market research where someone says. What would you do if, or what do you, you know? Right. And then, and then, would you want to spend less money? In some industries, it is built that you will come. For example, let's say if I, and this is something Steve talks about in his book, if I have a cancer, the, the drug that cures cancer, right. yeah, I, I'm not going to have to do too much customer development or market research to actually figure that out. It's going to sell like, you know, hotcakes, right? But that's that's not the case for most tech products, okay? Where they, they, it's market risk, not, not, uh, not technology risk. Right. Um, could you, you know, I, I know Steve, I actually, I executive recruiter, I found the CMO for Epiphany, one oh, okay. of the previous companies yeah. um, for him. So, could you point to actually success stories versus case studies with, I don't, did he use it for Epiphany? I never asked him that. Yeah, I think, so. That was a CRM company. Right, right. right. So, great, great point. That's a, a common, commonly asked question. What we found actually in, in the book that we, uh, that Brent and I wrote, is that, uh, People have been doing this stuff in one way or the other. They, have, they may have not called it actually yeah. customer development per se, but been taking iterative elements of it, talking to people, and and they've been very successful. So we actually had one conversation. And these these case studies are in the book, where on the phone we're talking to this entrepreneur, and I'm describing you know, customer development. And he goes, no, 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 that's bullshit. Here's what you got to do. You got to iterate. You got to be very skeptical of your assumptions. I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I was talking about, right? right. And so people actually do this. Uh, and again, they may not call customer development, they may not follow the process in this order, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the main, you know, what you want to take away from, from Steve books, Steve's book is question your assumptions, right? And, and recognize they're all assumptions, you know, be it about your product, your market, your price, whatever, you, you know, your, your sales channels. And, you know, two, get out of the building. If you ask Steve, he says, if people just get out of the building, the founders actually get out of the building and talk to customers face, you've done 90% of it, which I, you know, think it's so the besides his company, Epiphany, right? Can you mention some other companies? That you so think you know, I think uh, people, the people at Art, Artvark that was just recently sold, they're doing stuff like this. Um, I'm trying to think of the yeah, so, Zobni, Zobni yeah. just did a good case. What's that? Zobni the Zobni. Zobni. Yeah, Zobni's doing a lot of stuff. Uh, very similar Dropbox. type stuff. They're doing Dropbox. very well. Dropbox. 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 Dropbox, right? So the same people that you saw. Floatown. 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 Right. Oh, Dropbox. Right. Dropbox actually a really crappy example because they. They were at the they, they were at the you know the, the circle you know meeting and they basically said well it's just we can't build what we thought we like did you talk to really no not really they should be at a different conference they can just, well no but I mean when you're when you're your products when you're the customer for your product that has lean elements in and of itself it's also dangerous um, yeah look well, I'm going to screw you out I think I think it's actually just right to say that other than there's probably others that need to yeah yeah I know, but it's not yeah I mean it, I, I know that's very that's a very common. Uh, it's funny because actually I'm I'm the take the opposite view of you, yeah. Lowell. Actually, I when people say that you know scratch the same itch problem, I find that one for me personally compelling. I mean I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, maybe, but because the way you solve the problem would be radically different than your customer, and that's another thing I found out about talking to our customers with this stuff is the way literally the way they solve problems, the way they view the world is radically different than I do. Intuition is dangerous. Yeah. Oh, but, but, but it, 
But I think it's not a black and white issue. No, not like, at all. What not I would all. imagine, I can't recall his name, the founder of Dropbox, but what, what, what I would imagine happened was he, was he had an issue that he wanted to scratch. He also knew of a dozen or two dozen friends that had the same scratch. And so he wasn't he wasn't doing this in a, uh, in a vacuum based on his, his, right. his singular vision. It was a more of an iterative process with sort of this informal um, customer. You know, did you this, hear the talk? What's that? Did you hear this talk? I did. Yeah, I mean, he, he basically, you know, he, he basically, you're right, he didn't like the other products that were out there. He liked them. He, he wanted one. He tried the other ones. They didn't work. He figured he knew what a good one should be and built it. He didn't do much iteration at all. Plus, he could see. I can't recall what he, what he talked about, but I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it, I can't rec I'm not sure exactly what he said. I was really struck by the fact it just, I mean, I don't misunderstand me, I'm good, good on the guy. You know? Anyway, let, let, this, let me get some more questions and we can have this talk about beers anyway. So, so I've seen some places, and I don't know if it's in Steve's work or not, but they suggest there's actually a step prior to coming up with those mock-ups and testing an actual sort of product design of going out and doing what seems more like more more classic market research, asking questions, finding out the pain points, understanding right. the business, etc. Right. The way you told the story suggested that you went to the product design earlier and had the conversation off the right. of product design because, like, that pain point about sponsor dollars versus right. ben attendee dollars right. and all that kind of stuff. So, is that so? Yeah, I'd be happy to address that. So, there's different. So, we were doing a you know a B two B thing. There's people doing B2C stuff, and they're doing things like exactly, so instead of building product, building a landing page, driving traffic to it, and getting people to give you know, email, email addresses or, or what have you. And in, in a way, and this is actually quite a lot of debate in the community, is that a minimal viable product? You know, if I say, I'm going to build an awesome toaster, and I, get you, you know, I drive traffic at it, and I convert 10% of the people to actually leave their email, email address. Some people say that's not a minimal viable product because it's, it's not a product. Right, but uh, but it can be an effective way of, of testing ideas. I think it depends on the idea. Uh, I've used it for some things. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's uh, it's something that I would go to every time. The surveys are also a lot of times part of that. Um, those definitely uh, help. Again, I know this is not a helpful answer, but it, it all depends on on you and how you want to do it. Well, I guess though, I, I mean, I'm looking at exactly this this question right now, and. My tendency is always to go and build lay, lay out, well, not necessarily build something, but mock something up and, and ask questions about it. Whereas, if, when I just looked at your example, uh, you know, knowing trade show businesses, I could have told you the sponsor thing without you ever having the screen there. And so you probably could have found that out through other means. But I don't personally, going and asking people random, you know, not random questions, but asking those questions feels a lot less comfortable to me for some reason. Because yeah, I'm not providing value to them. I'm not showing them an opportunity. I'm not identifying early adopters. All that stuff that I that I like. I, I don't know about your, your case, but in our case, we were getting the meetings where we were actually providing value. Where we introduced generally introduced a new idea to them, and what they did, the people that liked it, you know, they would go Google the competition immediately. Like, but, wow. but you're but you're not coming in with the classic market research. Tell me about your business. No. Tell me how you get your money. Tell me, you know, which is the questions I, people are suggesting. I think one thing that you could do is, um, you know, you could have customer interviews to to sort of test your problem hypothesis, and I think that's something that you could do. I mean, okay. I, I did that actually with the, with the thing that we were talking about before this started. And, and so, in this case, the problem hypothesis is people want to have more interaction around events, or organizers want to have better interaction for attendees. Yeah, I mean, you could even get more specific with it. Um, well, so, so, what would that look like in practice here? I guess is what I'm trying to put my head around. Let me take some of the mistakes we made, and I, and I find them sort of kind of. They, I don't think we made a bunch of mistakes, and so we didn't, you know, do this picture perfect by any means. But so one of our data points was that people who were actually attending these events, there's a big disconnect, disconnect between the attendees and the organizers. Where people who were attending, what they like, this is great, we want this. We actually talked to a bunch of people. Yep. We're like, we want this, we want. I would use this, I would use this, I would use this, right? Uh, so with that, you know, that was a data point, and. And we actually, we had users on it. We got actually great feedback. People loved it. In fact, one of the sort of, uh, uh, one of our a good way to judge user pain is when they don't get something they were expecting. So one of our clients actually used this. They, one of their attendees didn't get an invite. They just missed the thing, just the technical thing. And they like, they called us up like, where's my invite? I need to be able to network before the thing, right? So we're like, oh, this is awesome. So the actually attendees loved it. And the, 
the early adopters, they also liked it, right? But again, for it to hit that you know, product market fit and really be a scalable business, we'd have to change something radically, a few things radically. And that was a disconnect where, and again, you know, I thought I knew something about the event business. I, I didn't, I don't, right? So, uh, and so, I, I guess, you know, you have these disconnects that you just, you have to find out some way or other. Granted, if you have deep industry experience, you're gonna, you don't have to go through as painful as a process as, as I did, yeah. right? But with any new market or new product, you're gonna run to this, you know, it's not like we're selling possibles. Right? I guess I'm trying to figure out, so Pete, what, what do you guys do then, in terms of that, the interview process? Well, I mean, there was one, there was one case where, um, you know, we actually had the idea, we were probably just going to build it because it, it, it wasn't going to take that much effort to do so, but I still wanted to have the customer interviews, and Sarah and I, who's in, who's in the back, um, we called up some of the uh, customers, and we just had a conversation with them, and um, <clears throat> I think Cindy Alvarez is another blogger that everyone here should oh, follow. Yeah, she should be on the list too, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's great uh, product manager for, for KISS, KISS Metrics, and... Um, she does a lot of blogging about customer research, and they have some products around that as well. Um, so check check that site out. Okay. But, uh, anyhow, she had some good good ideas in this, and, and I started to put some questions together that were really sort of put myself. I, I was trying to put myself in the shoes of the customer, sort of in their workflow. Was their day like? Sort of like, you know, there, again, there's companies that do this, and they don't, you know, they do it in different ways, like. Um, What's that uh, UX firm up in Seattle, or is it up north? Um, well, there's a whole, there's, there's people like IDEO. What's it? IDEO. Yeah, that, that's what I was actually thinking of a different one, but uh, Adaptive Path, I think is what I was thinking of. And, you know, these are the type of people that will go inside a customer's home and embed themselves and see exactly what they're doing. And, you know, this is what the Procter & Gamble does, too. They want to see, you know, how you do laundry. Uh, what do you do before you put the load of laundry in? What do you do after? What do you, you know, everything. And I tried to have this conversation, and, and Cindy had some great questions. Um, and I could use, like, well, what do you do? Well, one of the things we're offering is, is a way for uh, bloggers to share deals and get paid. And so we asked them, well, what do you do before, uh, before you put a deal on your blog? You know? And they said, well, you know, the first thing I do is, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I check my emails in the morning. And what do you mean? Tell me some more about that. Well, I said, well, I get 150 emails from all these different uh, affiliate programs, and I have to sift through them to find the deals that I want to post that day. I'm like, oh, really? So how do you feel when you're doing that? Because, wow, I'm really rushed. I don't have that much time. And, and uh, man, it, actually, it's, actually, it's really a pain, you know? And I said, well, what would you think if, you know, if someone just told you what was the best deal today, and you didn't have to like sift through and figure it out for yourself. She goes, oh, that would be great. You know, and I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't had that customer conversation that actually I realized that there was another potential opportunity, another pain point that I didn't even like think about. It's not just that they want deals and make money off them, they want it to be easy for them because they're busy moms, you know, so. Back to the Procter & Gamble example really quickly, that's actually one, because they do this stuff, again, they probably don't call it customer development, but they actually go into the homes that's, for example, I think Steve cites in his book is Swiffer, you know, the, the mopping thing. That was like a massive success, partly because th these teams literally go to the homes and, uh, and, and, uh, and do this stuff, right? Yep. Please. Big box companies are maybe a bad example for this because they're never going to innovate something to destroy their current market share and the dollars they're bringing in-house. So they would never ask someone, what do you want about a better Swiffer? Right. They, the they would just say, we're going to leave it until a competition comes along, who innovates in the space, and then we'll acquire Are you talking about Costco or are you talking like Procter & Gamble? Procter & Gamble. No, no they, are, they do some cool yeah. stuff. They do some innovative stuff, I think, actually. I, I think I, they sit on old products and say it's new. Yeah, and I mean, we definitely want to milk what you got, but they, I mean, they, they, still, they, they need to do some innovation. I, I wouldn't write those guys off that much. So, so let's do uh, maybe one more question, and then we can, uh, as Patrick said, pick this up over beers or, or something. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I can talk about this all day. I don't have to be up here, but I, was, I can talk about this all day. I just want to be fair to the people that, you know, only sign up for till like 8.30 or whatever. I know we're going a little long, so right. I don't want to... Well, well, back to just one thing, one thing somebody said. So this guy, my friend Samir with ProProps, again, he's had, he has 300,000 users, right? It's a lot of users. I mean, it's a premium thing. And literally, you know, a few weeks ago, he got a lot of insight just by picking up the phone and talking to a paying customer, right? I mean, and again, his whole thing was like, paper's the enemy, paper's the enemy. Turns out, you know, again... He had, so it's funny, so you know, he was like, okay, let's do this, I'll call this guy. And he, he really, he, 
the two people that are paying, you know, two of the many people that are paying, but two of them aren't using it because of any of the online stuff, right? It's all about reordering questions and printing it out for their, their thing. And so that was a radical insight that would have never actually come about had, had he not accidentally, you know, left out the feature and actually then called up the federal to figure out what the problem was, right? And so, anyway, I think it's powerful stuff. Um, anyway, so.